there is such a disconnect between what goes on in the Capitol building, what goes on in the Oval Office, and what goes on in the rest of the country here. I thought I'd take us back to basics, because you you have conservatives or pseudo-conservatives telling us what conservatives are supposed to believe on immigration. You've got people at the uh, Wall Street Journal editorial board pushing a corporatist agenda, not a capitalist or conservative agenda, promoting open borders, and they have for decades. You have some other interests, many billionaires as well. Uh, I'm not against billionaires, I'm just against stupid billionaires who have really no regard for sovereignty and border security and are funding these projects, calling them conservative projects when they are left-wing Democrats with ads on TV featuring uh, Marco Rubio. And my good friend Marco Rubio, and he is, uh, I think uh, the more I've studied this now, the more I completely reject it, completely. And I want to go back to the beginning for everybody and talk about conservatism as it relates to immigration. For everybody, for us, for me, for you, for Marco Rubio, for, uh, for whomever. You see, folks, and this is right out of Liberty and Tyranny, the statist's argument for comprehensive immigration reform reduces to this. America is a nation of immigrants. The founding and settling of the nation came about because of immigrants who braved dangers to come to this country and risked everything to build the prosperity we enjoy today. Now, certainly this is true as far as it goes. But of course to say this is a nation of immigrants is to say every nation is a nation of immigrants. Mexico, the source of most immigrants in the United States today, is a nation of Spanish and other immigrants. But the implication is that both legal and illegal immigration, no matter how extensive, is another moral imperative justifying the transformation of the civil society. That simply is not the case. Once again, the Declaration of Independence provides guidance on this issue. It states in part that to secure these unalienable rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Furthermore, quote, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish the government and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. The Declaration of Independence. What does that mean? Have we the people, the governed, the American citizens, I stress the word citizens, have we consented to the current state of legal and illegal immigration in this nation? No. Do current immigration policies and enforcement practices affect the safety and happiness of we the people? Yes. The statist and the neo-statist, you may call them rhinos, they insist that in particular the 21st century immigrant in the United States is the spiritual heir of the immigrants who helped build the nation. And his motives are as noble and his ambitions as honorable as those of the founders. And so to deny him access to America's bounty and freedom displays an un-American meanness of character and is a renunciation of America's heritage. Isn't this pretty much what they say? Even worse, they portray the immigrant as universally more virtuous than the citizen. He's said to aspire to and indeed achieve a higher position of worthiness than the citizen, for he's doing jobs Americans won't do. He's a person of faith. He's a strong family man, etc., etc., etc. But the citizen is said to owe his sustenance to the immigrant who builds his home, maintains his property, harvests his food, raises his children, goes to war, on and on and on. Therefore, even the illegal immigrant deserves a privileged status in society in the sense that his law-breaking is said to be of personal necessity and, of course, of societal value. Consequently, he must be urged out of the shadows and into the light. He must be celebrated as a role model. And his virtuousness must be rewarded with citizenship. Have I pretty much tied up what's going on? For the conservative, this is a truly odd formulation. Since it demeans the citizen and the citizen's paramount role in American society, it is the community of citizens who consent to be governed and for whom the government exists. The principal responsibility of the government is to the citizen. Otherwise, the government ceases to be legitimate. To say that the citizen, who is in fact 
primarily responsible for the nation's character and the culture to which the alien immigrates is less valuable to American society than the immigrating alien is nonsensical. No society, let me repeat, no society can withstand the unconditional mass migration of aliens from every corner of the earth. The preservation of the nation's territorial sovereignty and, yes, the culture, the language, the mores, the traditions and customs that make possible a harmonious community of citizens dictate that citizenship be granted only by the consent of the governed, not by the unilateral actions or demands of the alien, and then only to the aliens who throw off their allegiance to their former nation and their former society and pledge their allegiance to America. This shouldn't be controversial. And these are principles that conservatives have supported throughout our existence. People who claim to be conservatives promoting all kinds of strange arguments these days are really big government neo-statists. good friend of mine, Edward Eller, Claremont Institute senior fellow, California State University professor, reflecting on Aristotle's observation. He wrote, this is important, a radical change in the character of the citizens would be tantamount to a regime change just as surely as a revolution in its political principles, quote, unquote. The government, therefore, folks, is not only justified, but obligated to qualify immigration to those who most likely contribute to the well-being of the civil society and to create the conditions in which aliens of differing backgrounds can be absorbed into the American culture. In 1965, as part of the great society, the statist did, in fact, lay the foundation for radically altering the character of American society and the relationship of we the people, the governed, to our government. When the statist signed, excuse me, when Lyndon Johnson signed the Hart Seller Act, he said, quote, this bill that we will sign today is not a revolutionary bill. It does not affect the lives of millions. It will not reshape the structure of our daily lives or really add importantly to either our wealth or our power, unquote. And during the debate over the bill on the floor of the Senate, Senator Ted Kennedy claimed, quote, First, our cities will not be flooded with a million immigrants annually. Under the proposed bill, the present level of immigration remains substantially the same. He said, the ethnic mix of the country will not be upset. These are Kennedy's words, not mine. Contrary to the charges in some quarters, the bill will not inundate America with immigrants from any one country or area and so forth. 1965. Big year, 1965, 1966. Medicare, Medicaid, and on and on and on. Johnson, Ted Kennedy, and the other statists were wrong. And it's hard to believe they were not intentionally deceiving the public as I believe we are intentionally being deceived today. In 1964, Republican vice presidential candidate Representative William Miller well understood the overall increase in immigration that would result from the 1965 Act. Here's what he said. We estimate that if the president gets his way and the current immigration laws are repealed, the number of immigrants next year will increase threefold and in subsequent years will increase even more. That 1965 bill abolished the decades-old policy of national quotas which was said to be discriminatory because it favored immigrants from Europe, especially the United Kingdom, Ireland, and Germany, over the Third World. So it increased immigration levels from each hemisphere, setting in motion a substantial increase in immigration from Latin America, Asia, and Africa, to the detriment of previously favored aliens from Europe. I'm laying out the facts. This isn't a question of me advocating or not. I'm laying out the facts. The bill also introduced in 1965 for the first time ever in American history a system of chain migration. Chain migration, which as the Center for Immigration Studies noted, gave higher preferences to the relatives of American citizens and permanent resident aliens than to applicants with special job skills. 
Now, those who receive preference for admission include, and there's a long list, unmarried adult sons and daughters of U.S. citizens, spouses and children, and unmarried sons and daughters of permanent resident aliens, and on and on and on. So the historical basis for making immigration decisions was radically altered during the Great Society. The emphasis would no longer be on the preservation of American society and the consent of the citizens that consent of the governed. Now aliens themselves would decide who comes to the United States through chain migration. And with the elimination of national quotas and the imposition of chain migration, aliens immigrating to the United States became poor, less educated, less skilled than those who preceded them. A pattern that, in fact, continues to this day. Conservatives believe in national sovereignty, a secure border, individual freedom, private property rights, the American culture. We're not against immigration. We're against anarchy. And that's exactly what's going on right now. And this law, all 800 and whatever pages of it, institutionalizes anarchy. That's my conclusion. You know, the late author Theodore White, who was a liberal and a Democrat, that is, he was no conservative. He wrote, quote, The Immigration Act of 1965 changed all previous patterns, and in so doing probably changed the future of America. It was noble, revolutionary, and probably the most thoughtless of many acts of the great society. Unquote. And it appears they're about to do the same thing. It appears they are. Now, I want to give you some information you're not going to hear from the Gang of Eight. Based on 2007 statistics, the latest we have in, some, in many respects, the nation's immigration population, legal and illegal, reached a record of, thir- of uh, 38 million. 38 million in 2007. That's about 15% of the population of the country. Immigrants account for one in eight U.S. residents, the highest level in 80 years. In 1970, it was 1 in 21. In 1980, it was 1 in 16. In 1990, it's 1 in 13. Today, it's 1 in 8. Overall, nearly 1 in 3 immigrants is an illegal alien. 1 in 3. Half of Mexican and Central American immigrants and one-third of South American immigrants are illegal. Of adult immigrants, 31% have not completed high school compared to 8% of natives. Since 2000, immigration increased the number of workers without a high school diploma by 14% and all other workers by 3%. The proportion of immigrant-headed households using at least one major welfare program is 33% or one-third, compared to 19% for native households. The poverty rate for immigrants and their U.S.-born children under 18 is 17%, nearly 50% higher than the rate for natives and their children. 34% of immigrants lack health insurance compared to 13% of natives. Immigrants and their U.S.-born children account for 71% of the increase in uninsured since 1989. Immigration accounts for virtually all of the national increase in public school enrollment over the last two decades. In 19, excuse me, in 2007, there were 10.8 million school-aged children from immigrant families in the United States. The Pew Hispanic Center estimates that 9% of the population of Mexico was living in the United States in 2004. 57% of all illegal immigrants are from Mexico. Another 24% are from other Latin American countries. 55% of all Mexicans in the United States are here illegally. By 2050, Hispanics will be between 29 and 32% of the nation's population. I'm not rooting for it or rooting against it. I am giving you facts.